the song of the wrinkled saint. We might very well describe it as the song of the senior saint. That's true as well. But perhaps wrinkled captured something that senior uh, doesn't capture. It seems clear from a, a preview of this psalm that the psalmist, whoever he was that penned this psalm, and there is some discussion uh, whether it was David or whether it was uh, Jeremiah or, or whether it was uh, some other man, uh, we can't be dogmatic about that. It seems to me that it was probably penned by David. That's always a good guess if we don't know for sure. It does contain a great deal of Davidic language within it. In fact, there are references to 50 other psalms someone has estimated within this one psalm. And so whoever it was that wrote this psalm was familiar with the psalms and knew the language of the psalms and employed that language in the writing of this one. Now, it fits in hand with what we're talking about tonight. Tonight, as we talk about a wrinkled saint, or we talk about a senior saint, we're talking about someone who for years has committed these songs to memory, has placed these songs within their heart, so that it is just a part of their vocabulary. It's just a part of their language as they speak, that they speak in terms of the Psalms. Now notice in Psalm 71 and verse 9 that the psalmist says, Cast me not off in the time of old age, forsake me not when my strength faileth. And so clearly he identifies himself as being in the point of life of old age. He's at the point of life where his strength is beginning to fail. And he's asking for God to please not to cast him off at this point in his life. Now go down to verse 18, you'll again see a reference to old age. He says in verse 18, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to every one uh, that is to come. And so again, we have a reference to old age, we have a reference to being gray-headed, and we have a reference or a plea for God not to forsake him at this point in his life. Notice in verse 20, Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Now sometimes we may describe someone and we may say that he has one foot in the grave. And that's basically what the psalmist is saying right here. I've got one foot in the grave, but God's bringing me back. God's lifting me back. God has work yet for me to do. And God has great plans, even at this age in my life, for me, And so God has brought me up again from the depths of the earth, or literally out of the grave, that I might do these things. Now when we think about the challenges that come with getting older, this psalm captures some of those challenges. And perhaps uh, some in this class tonight are at this point in life. And if you are at this point in life, then this ought to be a favorite psalm for you. Because it has some great things to say to you. I don't know if you realize it or not. I hope that we do. It's sad to think of it, but the church is growing older. The heyday of the church, perhaps, is a, a day that's already passed. I hope not. I hope that the brightest and the best days are ahead. But in many, many places, the church is growing old. The faithful, the sound, the wise, the committed members of those uh, that are up in years. And one by one we're losing them and we're not replacing them nearly as fast as we are losing them. And those with whom we are replacing them are not of the same caliber, caliber or character. And so it is a concern. But think about some of the challenges that come with age. First of all, there is the challenge of confusion. If you look at verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Sometimes as we grow older, life becomes confusing. The average events of life that we've done a hundred times suddenly don't make as much sense to us as they used to. Sometimes we can't remember things as well as we used to be able to remember them. And sometimes we get in a situation to where we are embarrassed to say, I've forgotten or I can't remember. And the psalmist doesn't want to be put to confusion or literally be, to be put to shame in that way. Notice as well in verse 4 that vulnerability or fear is a part of growing old many times. Think about the fact that those that are younger generally have some things to fall back on. 
They are working, and so financially they have a way of generating income. Most of their friends are still alive, and so they have those upon whom uh, they can call. They have the strength that comes from physical youth and health. But as you grow older, one by one, you begin to lose those things. You retire, you no longer have that income coming in. You may have retirement coming in, but you're not generating income. You're living off the income that has been gained in days gone by. Physical health, physical strength is not what it used to be. You can't rely on that as much as you used to be able to rely upon it. You don't have the friends that you used to have because you're beginning to lose your friends one by one. And so there is a certain kind of fear and a certain kind of vulnerability that comes from being in that point or that station in life. And that's what he's talking about in verse 4. He says, Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. He becomes increasingly concerned about the unrighteous and about the cruel. Most of us have known older individuals that become very fearful of things that used to not scare them at all. Become very very fearful of what others' intentions are and of what might happen. Think about as well that a part of growing older many times is failing strength. Notice in verse 9, he says, Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. There will come the day when you cannot physically do what you used to be able to do. Well, you don't have the strength to be able to run long distances like you once could. You don't have the strength to be able to lift and do things that you once took for granted and were able to do. That's a part of growing older. That's one of the things you have to deal with as that comes. Also, as you grow older, there is the fear of rejection. There is the fear that individuals won't need you anymore, won't want or desire you anymore. They won't see your value anymore. In verse 9, that's certainly a, a part of the equation here. He says, cast me not off in the time of old age. Those that are older fear being cast off. They fear being pushed aside. They, they fear being pushed out of the way, as it were. That's a real fear of growing older, that individuals won't see your value or see your worth anymore. Notice in verse 12 that another concern of growing older is that of loneliness. He says, O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. Growing older many times is a process of of loneliness. And it becomes lonely to grow old. And so the plea is for God to be close by Him. There is, of course, the, the fear of being forsaken. Notice in verse 18. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, forsake me not. Perhaps as people grow older, they fear that, that people won't take care of them, that people won't provide for them, that people will simply forsake them. That could, that's a concern that sometimes comes with growing older. And the psalmist had all of those concerns. He had all of those feelings. And so you can read this psalm and know that there's someone who understands. Someone who knows what that is like. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 19. Let's read an occasion in the Old Testament where there was a man by the name of Barzillai. Here was a man who had grown older. Now David still saw his worth. David still found great value in him. David's counselor, Ahithophel, had forsaken him, had gone over to the enemy. David is in need of uh, of some gray-headed man. He is in need of someone who possesses great wisdom, someone who can give him counsel that those who are younger cannot give him. David's in search of someone like that. And Barzillai fits that description. And David covets him. David wants him to come and to help him. But notice Barzillai's response, and perhaps this is the way that you sometimes feel uh, in, in your age. Notice in verse 33, the king said unto Barzillai, Come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. And Barzillai said unto the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king unto Jerusalem? You understand what Barzillai is saying? He's saying, I don't have a lot longer to live, David. Why why should I travel over to Jerusalem? Why should I come and live at your house? I I don't have many days left. This doesn't make sense to me. In verse 35, I am this day fourscore years old. I'm eighty years old. And can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? 
Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto the Lord the King? Notice what he says. He says, I have trouble discerning between good and evil now. My senses don't work the way that they used to work. I, I, I can't taste what I'm eating. I can't taste what I'm drinking like I once could. My hearing's not what it used to be. I can't hear the voice of singing men and singing women. I can't hear as well as I used to could hear. And notice what Barzillai says. He says, I don't want to be a burden unto the Lord the King. David, I don't want to be a burden to you. Now perhaps there are those even in this audience tonight that share the sentiments of Barzillai. And your feeling is, you know, I've reached this point in life and there are no great adventures ahead for me. There's no great things that, that I'm going to yet do in my life. Uh, my senses, my abilities are not what they used to be. I don't want to be a burden. And that's the way that Barzillai felt. And the psalmist is talking about that. And he's concerned with that. Maybe you are as well. Now, in this psalm, in Psalm 71, the word continually is used three times. And that's an important transition word within this psalm. I want you to notice. Notice in verse 3. Be thou my strong habitation. Whereunto I may continually resort. Notice as well in verse 6. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. Go on down to verse 14. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. Now the psalmist is making a commitment here. He says, I'm older, I face these difficulties, I face these problems, these are my concerns at this point in life, but God, as long as I'm alive, God, as long as you give me the strength to do so, here are some things that I'm going to do continually. Here are some things that I'm not going to stop doing as long as I'm alive. And these are things, of course, that ought to be key to your mind tonight, that you will not stop doing as long as God gives you life, as long as God gives you strength. Now notice that he's going to refer to God giving him this strength in verse 16. He says, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness even of thine only. Now in verse 9, he has told us that his strength is failing. He's not physically able to do what he used to could do. But in verse 16, he says, I will go in the strength of the Lord. In other words, Lord, I know you're going to give me the strength to do these things. And as long as you give me this strength, here's what I'm going to do with that strength. I'm going to serve you. And he promises to do three things. In the first five verses, he says, I will trust. In verses 6 through 14, he says, I will thank. And in verses 15 through 24, he says, I will teach. So let's take a look at this psalm. We're not really going to go outside of this psalm. We're not going to go and look at other verses and find other verses on, on these points because this is an expository lesson. We're just going to work down through this psalm. You know, something that it, it, it's taken me a long time to realize, and I guess a lot of preachers are the same way, is we feel like we've got to support everything we say with, with a whole host of scriptures. And yet, when we're reading this psalm and we're studying this psalm, what are we reading and what are we studying? Scriptures. Everything we read is a scripture. We don't have to go somewhere else to get it. It's right here. And when we read it right here, it carries the same power and the same force as if we went somewhere else and found the same thing stated. But sometimes we run all around and we, we miss the, the point that is at hand. So take a look at this and take a look at the trust uh, that he promises to give to God. Now there are perhaps some things that the wrinkled saint isn't able to do. Physically, not able to do some of the things that he or she used to could do. Uh, there may be some other ways in which they are limited, but there are some things that they can still do, and one of the things that any saint can still do is trust in God. And so he promises, I will trust in you. Notice in verse 5, he says, For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. I've trusted you from my youth. I'm not going to stop trusting you now. It's amazing to me that there are individuals that will serve God, that will trust God all of their lives, and then when they reach a certain advanced age, they just quit. They quit trusting God. 
They, they quit running the race. They, they don't finish the final lap. I, I don't understand that. I don't understand how you can go through life and trust God through every phase of life and then get to the very end of life and quit trusting Him. And the psalmist says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust you to the very end. Notice in verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. He promises that his trust is in God. Notice in verse 3, But thou, be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. He says, You're my hiding place. You're the place where I can go for protection and salvation and security, and I can continually resort there. Have you ever thought about the fact that wherever you are, whenever it is, you have a hiding place? You're never away from a safe place. Because wherever you are, God is. And at any moment, you can flee to God for refuge. That's true wherever you are. And that's true whatever time of day or night uh, that it may be. That is all always available to you. Notice in verse 5, he speaks of God as his hope. And he speaks of God as his trust. And so first of all, he says, I will trust. But in the second place, he says, I will thank. Notice beginning in verse 6. By thee have I been holding up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. Think about some things uh, that are suggested here. First of all, the same point is true. There are some things he may not be able to do anymore, but one of the things he can still do, as long as he has life, as long as God gives him strength, is he can say thank you. And he can express his praise or thanks to God. But he speaks of the fact that from the womb, God has taken care of him. The psalmist is saying, literally, before I could take care of myself, you were taking care of me. You see, my trust has been well placed in you because you took care of me before I could do anything to help. Before I could do anything in response. You were taking care of me. He says, my praise shall be continually of thee. This is something that I can do continually. This is something that I can do every hour of every day of every, day, uh, of every week. This is something I can do. I can trust. Now, whatever I, I could be flat of my back on a hospital bed, unable to do anything else, but I can still trust. I could be standing at the grave of a loved one, unable to do anything about the events or circumstances that have taken place. But there's something I can still do. I can still trust. There's never a time in life when that is not something that I can do. And in fact, in those moments, that may be perhaps all that I can do. But I can still do that. I can still trust in God. And at those moments, I can still thank God. Not thank God for what has happened, but thank God in the midst of what has happened. Thank God in spite of what has happened. Thank God uh, in, in spite of the circumstances or difficulties that I'm in. And that's what the psalmist is going to do right here. Now many people, especially as they grow older, this becomes more common, that they begin to complain. They begin to complain about their aches and their pains and, and the difficulties that they have. But this psalmist says, that's not what I'm going to spend my time doing. I'm going to spend my time giving thanks to God, praising God for what the care that God has always given me. Now notice that he continues. He says in verse 8, Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. That's the same as saying continually. My mouth, here's what it's going to be filled with. It's going to be filled with praise. It's going to be filled with honor. And it's going to be filled with thy praise, with thy honor. That's what I'm going to spend my time doing. I'm going to spend what time and what strength I have left giving thanks, giving glory to you. Now notice he continues down through here. He says in verse 14, But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. I will hope continually. Literally, I'm not going to give up hope. I'm never going to forsake the hope that I have. That's going to be something that is continually 
with me. Now, when you serve a God with whom all things are possible, you're never beyond the realm of hope. Because all things are possible with Him. Now, with man, you get to the point to where man's powerless to do anything about it. Man's powerless to change anything. Man's powerless to undo things. But when you dwell and live and serve a God with whom all things are possible, then you have to understand that hope never, ever goes away. Notice he says, I will yet praise thee more and more. As your life has progressed, has your thanksgiving progressed? Do you praise God as much today? Really, do you praise God more today than you did yesterday, than you did last year, than you did ten years ago. You say, well, my life's not what it used to be. You see, financially I'm not where I used to be. Physically I'm not where I used to be. As far as my family's concerned, I'm not where I used to be. It's not what I ask about. I ask whether or not you praise God more and more each passing day. Now, look at Job chapter 1, just in your mind's eye. Just think about that story and think about all that Job lost in chapter 1. But what did Job do when he lost all of those things? Job didn't say, I'm going to praise God less and less because I have less and less. You know, life isn't as good as it used to be, and so I'm not going to praise God as much as I used to pray. If anything, Job praised God more. He didn't pray, praise Him less. He didn't give Him less thanks. He maybe, in some ways, appreciated more what God had given him and what he had than he ever had before. Have we ever known anyone who suffered some kind of calamity, perhaps a tornado or a fire or something else destroyed their house? They lost a great deal. They didn't have what they used to have and perhaps will never get it back as long as they live. But we're more thankful after that time for the things that they did have. They appreciated the blessings of life far more than they ever appreciated them before. They were able to thank God more after the fact than they were before the fact. That's something the psalmist says that he's able to do. He's able to praise God more and more. But notice this as well. He says, I will teach, beginning in verse 15. Now this is closely connected with praise. Because one of the ways that we thank God, we honor God, we praise God, is through teaching God's Word. So they're closely connected, but we want to separate them for the purpose of emphasis here. There again are some things that the psalmist can't do, but something he can still do is he can still teach people about God. I know people, you know people perhaps as well, who don't have the physical health to go out and knock on doors anymore. They don't have the physical health to carry the gospel in that way, even to their neighbor, much less to another country. And yet, they are continuing to teach God's Word. You can do that whatever your health is. You may have to do it at times through the agency of another. You may have to do it merely by supporting for another, or merely by financially supporting another, or, or maybe even just by praying for another. But most of the time, at least, you can do it through the influences, through the people you know in your life, and simply talking to them about spiritual things and telling them what you know. And the psalmist here says uh, that he is going to do that. Now, one, one thing that I hear on a fairly regular basis, and I'm not in charge of this anymore, and so maybe I don't hear it as much as I once did, but when we try to get teachers to teach classes, one of the things that, that I've heard down through the years is, well, you know, I did that. You know, I did that. I, I used to teach Bible class all the time. But, but, but now, I'm going to let somebody younger do that. I, I've handed that off to somebody else. You know, I, I put in my time. I hear people say that sometimes. But you know, one of the things that the Bible stresses is that those that are older are to teach. You remember in Titus chapter 2 and verses 3 through 5, it's the older women that are supposed to teach the younger women. You say, well, I'm, I'm an older woman, and I've taught Bible class, and I've done this, and I've done that. God says, I want you to teach. God says, you're at a point in life whereby your experience, experience, whereby the wisdom that comes with living, 
you're in a position to be able to teach somebody else what you know. That doesn't guarantee they'll listen to you. They may not listen to you. They may think you're out of touch and they may think you don't know. You may have to deal with that type of resistance. But God says, I want you to teach. There's still lessons that you can teach and I expect you to be teaching. Who is better qualified? than those that are older to teach. You know, I've, I've, I've often wondered about this. And I know the answer to it, even though I don't like to admit it, but I know the answer to it. You know, by and large, who we send to the mission field? Young men beginning to preach. Oh, they've got the zeal, but they don't possess the knowledge or the experience of somebody that's older. You know what we do with, with the older preacher who has the experience? We put him in a pulpit somewhere. We make him stationary. He preaches to the same 150, 250, 350 every week. Nothing wrong with that. But if anybody's in the mission field, if anybody ought to be there, if anybody has the experience and the knowledge to be there, who is it? It's that man. It's that man. You, you see, you run, on, run up on some things in the mission field that you don't run up on here. They'll ask you some questions that you've never considered before because we've already hammered all that out in the local congregation. Those things don't get asked anymore. People know better than to ask about that. People, people aren't curious about that anymore. But in the mission field, that's not true. Sometimes we don't use the ones that we ought to to teach the lessons that God has for them to teach. Psalm 71 in verse 15, he says, My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. He said, here's what my mouth's going to do. It's not going to complain. It's not going to, to fuss. It's going to be to show God's righteousness, to show His salvation, to help other people to come to know that. Notice he says in verse 16, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness even of thine only. Notice in verse 17, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thou wondrous works. Now notice what he's saying. It's the point I'm trying to make. He says, all of my life, God, I've taught people about you. And I'm not about to stop doing that now that I'm old. I, I, I taught, I, you taught me, and then I taught others what you taught me, and I did that from my youth, and now that I'm old and frail and feeble, I'm not going to quit doing that. I'm going to continue to do that. Many of you know uh, Perry Cotham. Many of you know that name from the Brotherhood. Perhaps through the years you've read his tracts or read his books. year before last, or last year I guess it was actually, I was out in Austin, Texas uh, on a lectureship and Brother Perry Cotham spoke on that Sunday morning. And Brother Perry Cotham, I don't, does anyone know exactly how old Brother Cotham is? I think he's in his early 90s. Yeah. He, he, he's okay. And his wife's been gone for a number of years as well. But you know what he was speaking on that morning? He was speaking on marriage. And I'm sure that there were people in that audience that thought, what does a 92-year-old man have to tell me about my marriage? But I'm here to tell you it's one of the best lessons I ever heard on, I've ever heard on marriage. He had the wisdom to talk about that subject. It may not have been from the approach that somebody my age would have approached it. He may not have, uh, have dealt with, with everything that we might deal with, but what he said was practical. And it was wise. And it was based on years and years of, of experience. And even though his mate was gone, he hadn't forgotten these things. They were still very, very ingrained in his mind. It's amazing to me to consider what he had to say about that subject. And it's the point here is you don't forget these things. You can pass these things on. Notice in verse 18, he says, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have shown thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. He says, 
Let me show your strength. Let me show your power. How, how can God's power, God's strength better be seen than in someone who is at the point of life where God is their strength? And it's clearly the case that God is their strength. Their, their physical strength is failing. It's obvious who their strength is. Now, the reason I make that point is think about Abraham. And think about Abraham producing a child when he's past the age of being able to do that. Sarah's past the age of being able to do that, plus the fact she's barren and has been barren her whole life. Where could God, God better demonstrate His power and demonstrate His strength than in Abraham and Sarah? And in bringing a child into the world through them, where could God better show His power and show His strength? You remember that... Paul would talk about the gospel in earthen vessels. And I'm convinced that he had in mind inspired men. Didn't have in mind just people like us, but he had in mind inspired men. Men that he inspired to preach and teach and write his word. But there is an application to us, and that is that we're earthen vessels. And God demonstrates his power by using us to do his work. Those who are weak and frail and feeble, God accomplishes great things through us, and it shows His power. Notice verse 24. It says, My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought into shame, and see my hurt. He says, My tongue, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about your righteousness. I'm going to do that all the day long. I'm going to do that continually. God, as long as you grant me life, as long as you grant me strength, I'm going to be teaching your Word. Those are three things that you can do, whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, whatever your age, you can trust God, you can thank God, and you can teach God. I don't mean teaching God something, but I mean teaching other people something about God. You can do that. Whatever your age and whatever your circumstance in life, the point of the matter is, God's going to one day give us rest. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God, Hebrews chapter 4 and 4 tells us. John said, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, for they shall rest from their labors, Revelation 14 and verse 13. But I don't read at any point in this life when God has given us life and strength that we're supposed to be resting. We're supposed to be working. Whether we're a young person, whether we're in that middle portion of our lives, or whether we're advanced in age, as long as we're here, and as long as God gives us life and strength, we are supposed to be doing things for Him. Now, it may get down to the point to where we can't do some of the things that we used to could do. There's still things that we can do. And we ought to be doing those for the Lord. Thank you for your attention tonight.